Welcome back once again to Kevin Pollock's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. This light seems like it's in the way of that camera, Dr. Chen. I'm sure it isn't. Just letting you know, I'm uh, looking into the surface of the sun one inch from the actual lens. So I'm going I'm to stop doing that. I would like to make eye contact with you, those of you around the world, but I can't. Um, a couple things to tell you. First of all, we're coming to you uh, as, as, as of late, as of always. Uh, you're allowed to laugh, it's okay. Uh, from the West Side Comedy Theater here in the West Side of Los Angeles, California, IA. Uh, if you ever want to see a live comedy show, Jamie uh, was here last night, in fact, with the Murrays, with the Brian Doyle oh, yeah. yes, and the Tina Murray to see um, Owen Benjamin? That's it. Oh, I knew his first name was Owen. I couldn't think of his last name. Owen Benjamin, yes, who was one of his, uh, uh, Brian's co-stars from Solomon and Sons. Solomon and Sons. Yeah. The, uh, the TVS show. And he, was, and, and he was headlining the Saturday show, which is uh, one of the founders of this theater, Chris Gorbos. That's his show. He's the MC and produces the show. Right. And lines up all the talent. And yeah, it's just like a, you know, a variety of different comedians. And then they have like a... A, a headliner decent, dude. Yeah, a decent headliner. And I spoke to him last night about it. I'm going to do it. We tur you turned Dana you Carvey. Have to get the, but then he asked that you, um, he, you have to submit some audition tapes. Oh, I do have to su submit audition he doesn't, tapes. He didn't want to confirm. That's right. That's right. He couldn't confirm yet. a date until I submitted a tape. And I had to explain, I'm not sure I have any VHS tapes anymore of myself, <laughs> other than uh, on the Merv Griffin show. <laughs> but I could submit a DVD copy of my last uh, uh, stand-up special, and maybe that would win me favor. Um, I have a lot of old tapes of you. <laughs> do you? <laughs> yeah. Corey Levin, by the way, sitting in for Sam Levine, who is, I believe, traveling back today from uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, AKA Shithole? Uh, mm. He's from Connecticut. Hartford? Shithole. Okay, thanks. <laughs> was he I'm, getting insurance? No, he was at. <laughs> <laughs> he was at uh, one of those conventions. Sam now goes to conventions, signs the autographs. You know, I love that he was at a convention in Connecticut the same weekend that the biggest convention in the U.S. Comic Con. Comic Con is, you know, they it's didn't want to. Yeah, it no. took a pass. They, they, they had a Sam Levine booth, <laughs> but they would not let Sam into it at, at the Comic Con in San Diego. It was, uh, it was taken over by the entire cast from Dexter. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I want to thank uh, John Casey and everybody here at the Westside Comedy Theater for making this our home. Uh, we uh, we turned to Dana. You'd like to take the credit for turning our friend Dana Carvey on this place. I take the now, credit for everything that happens at the That's this right. Theater. He does a show here once a month. Uh, but a lot of sketch shows, a lot of great sketch comedy sketch teams, a couple of which my, one I've of my just, favorite sketch teams, Pretty Pretty Pony. Pretty is, Pretty Pony. It's Monday night at 10 p.m. this Monday, the second Monday of every month. Do you know who the guest uh, monologist? It's on that wall behind me. Well, if read I could it, read it. Sake. What does it say? Ryan Lambert. The Ryan Lambert. Yeah. From it, the Monster Squad. Monster from, Squad. If Cole got booked him, it's probably from some movie from 1987. So yes, Monster Squad Monster is probably Squad. correct. I think it uh, is. It's, yes, I guarantee you it's This is what happens. You two have just turned into uh, what's his name and what's his name from Sesame Street up in the balcony. <laughs> Bert and Ernie? There we go. No, in the balcony. Oh, that's not Sesame Street. That's, that's Statler and Waldorf, and that's the Muppet Show. Yeah, you're right. Wildly different. Muppets in both? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to guess Philbert and McGillicuddy. So I now think. I want to thank Sam Levine for A, not being here, B, <laughs> filling in my absence last Sunday. When I was in Las Vegas, uh, possibly winning or losing $1 million in a very high profile uh, poker tournament that will air on NBC Sports Network the end of July, where uh, five celebrities played down to one, five pros played down to one, and then they go heads up for $1 million. Second place, of course, a set of used steak knives. Um, can't tell you the results, but I encourage you to tune in July 29th, I believe. They're going to air the celebrities show, and then the next night, the pros, and the next night, and then each night they back up and show the previous and eventually all three hours in a row. It's going to be fast, way more fascinating than how I just explained it. Um, Jamie, you've got some family coming in this summer. That's exciting. Just my niece. Oh. The 17-year-old. I was who I was discussing. You were just discussing She Jayden. Instagrammed a, a selfie in a bikini at the wave pool and at her the cabin, wave pool the settler cabin wave pool if you're from western pennsylvania you're familiar and if you're not like the rest of the fucking world <laughs> jay back knew okay um, well, of course <laughs> but 
but her caption was, so many dad bods, so little time. And so it, little time for the 17-year-old. And I, I don't know, it, it's got to... It set me back. Oh, oh yeah. Man. That's going to tighten in? everyone's <laughs> finger. Um, August 12th. In the, in the immediate tight. area. Mine's tight. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, we're coming to you live on the YouTube right now. Apparently, there was a glitch or seven. <laughs> so we thank the YouTube people for working their shit out. Uh, <laughs> subscribe to us on the YouTube if you dare. Write a review, you son of a bitch. Would it kill you? Do you listen on the, on the Earwolf? How do you do the show? We've got a new uh, fan mail email kpcsfanmail at gmail.com kpcsfanmail at gmail.com write to us uh, you can write ask kevin is a game we're going to bring back today not really a game just Ooh, an opportunity ask kevin. ask kevin is back we used to have a graphic for it it goes like this nope <laughs> and uh and after that we have a larry king game who i did not i don't think i told our guest today how to play the larry king game but we'll finish the interview with his own version of the Larry King game. <laughs> uh, you write in your own Larry King game, you win yourself a t-shirt. We have a winner today, Jeremy Vern, who writes, fantastic show, love it, never stop being great. I enjoy it on the YouTube and the iTunes. See, that is a fan. And here's his Larry King game. Bad Larry King impression, these are the rules. Uh, Larry shares something about himself, and then you go to the phones. And the name of the city you go to is funny, it helps. When I was in my mother's womb, a doctor, a Dr. Moses, no relation, mentioned to my parents that he saw two distinct outlines on the x-ray of her stomach. From that point forward, my parents acted as if they were having twins, naming us Lawrence and Eugene. On the day of my birth, the second mass turned out not to be my twin, as indicated on the x-ray, but in fact, <laughs> my prostate. From that point forward and until her dying day, my mother referred to me only as Eugene's brother. <laughs> Lick skillet, Tennessee. Go. <laughs> that is how you play the Larry King game to win yourself a Kevin Pollock Jet Show t-shirt. Oh, Our guest today receiving one in his gift bag. That's right. We, re we maintain the only podcast with a gift bag. Uh, now ask Kevin. Shannon Green of St. Louis, Missouri asked, Dear Kevin, is Dr. Kenny Chen an MD or a PhD or something else? <laughs> Dr. Chen, how would you answer that? Or something else? I think he has a PhD in hard knocks. A PhD in hard knocks is the correct answer. That's what we were I looking like for. That. The board goes back. <laughs> uh, write to us again at uh, kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. My guest today, um, we're all pretty damn excited. See, there's one last question that came in from him. Uh, we have our famous questions uh, section, the new segment on the show we'll get to a little later. And we had some amazing submissions. Um, I'm going to ask him where the hell we first met because it's a game I like to play when I have longtime friends. How the fuck did we meet again? Uh, because I'm 107, please welcome multi award winning, multi award nominated Josh Trump. More nominated than won. Yeah. Mainly lost. Well, that's the beautiful thing about Everybody. being nominated. Yeah, you, you, you lose. You win by being nominated. And here's why that is not a cliche. Of all the people who could have been nominated, yeah. giant number, just five made the nomination sure. list usually, sure. right? So at that point, it's, it's almost nonsense who actually gets plucked. I mean, you know, you're right. It is. It's not a cliche. It's true. It is the whole idea of people saying it's just an honor to be nominated. It really is. Because mm -hmm. I think there's so much... I mean, not to sound like a, a dick. Too late. But, no, because I, you know, I always thought of those things like you think, God, what the terror of what you would say if you actually won one of those damn things. Yeah. <laughs> but then the feeling is when people say, you know, it really is just an honor to be nominated, it's true because I feel like the business is so competitive. It's so nasty that, you know, I don't really love the idea of award shows, yet, you know, you go to them if your name is called. Sure. It's, it's complete honor. And, you can't you know, believe it. Of course it'd be nice if, you're, if, if, if you were the one to take home some trophy but at the same time it's like yeah. not really what inspired me to get in the business per se did I ever so tell you the Alan Arkin of, yeah oh he told but, but then he, he never said it then he never said no, it no in fact in fact Adam his son Adam was just directing us on um, Masters of Sex the show I'm working on now and uh and I said that story I said you know your dad told me the story and then uh, of course he won and but he said when he told me the story have you told the story already on the on I the had show? him on the show and, and asked he him told about it. it I said you there are two things I want to say. Yeah. I've always hated this award and everything it's ever stood for. 
And number two, this is the happiest day of my life. Good night. <laughs> yeah. But he said, but he said at the time, he told me that story. He said, I, I never have the guts to say that, actually. Which so. blew my mind because he told everyone he ever knew for 20 years that he would say it's that. It's greatest. I yeah. love it. Um, I have a, a, my own version of that, the fantasy thing, is to, is to go up there and say, you know, all the applause dies down and you say, Jeez. man, did you get this right? Right, and then test, <laughs> test the response on that. And if that goes well, say, seriously, I, I would like to thank the Academy, specifically those that voted for me, um, those that didn't. What does this feel like? <laughs> Come on, would that be great? Sure. Could you imagine? I think more honesty is better at those but things. But also, Absolutely. yeah, you can Come can't. on. I mean, what was the, who was the actor that did the push-ups? Um, Jack Palance. Jack Palance, yeah. yeah. Right? I said Palance. Palance, I've heard right? Palance, is it Palance also. Or pa I don't even know. That's but but you don't want to be remembered for being that guy. I think is the mispronouncing his name. No. Oh, the guy doing the one arm push up. <laughs> That's true. I'm 71. I, watch this. I was pretty badass. It was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought I was pretty badass. Yeah. Question, Corey. Didn't he also say when he came out? Didn't he say Billy Crystal? I crap bigger than him or yes. something like yes, that. Yes, he did. Yeah. And then he's the one that announced Marissa Tomei, which is why everyone thought it. Wasn't. I want to say, and don't take this wrong. You project much better than Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Oh! I've been taking classes. Sam is watching. He's somehow dialed in from the plane. I miss Sam. I wish Sam was here. Sorry, Sam. Here's how I picture Sam. He's sitting on the pilot's lap. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, someone said he's in Hartford. Was he getting insurance? The only insurance he's getting is with a blackjack dealer. Okay, <laughs> let's be clear here. <laughs> oh, man. Um, you know what? First, let's talk about uh, uh, Amy Schumer because you're, you're doing a, a, a handsome run on the Masters of Sex right now, shooting in the Los Angeles greater area. Thank you, sir. But Cold her... city, to be precise. All right. Her show is... Is back running? Did she do one of those things where the six episodes air it's and then done she takes? It's done now. Her takes, the, the, the season finale was Tuesday. Finally, but yeah. there was a little time off in the middle of the yeah, she run, took right? Like three they weeks did. or a month off or something. Yeah, something. Yeah. I don't know. What so you about. did uh, once again one of the more talked about episodes of the year, which was kind of a Friday Night Lights, uh, well, completely Friday Night Lights, uh, mm -hmm. not parody, but used that milieu to to say what. Exactly. Well, I mean, it's just to, you know, to deal with the subject of, I think, of, of rape in sports culture. I don't think it's Friday Night Lights per se that it was sort of criticizing as much no, as the world of, of, you know, high schools in Ohio and places where you have these, you know, where I just think our priorities are out of whack as to, um, you know, what's acceptable <laughs> and, and how far you can sort of deny <laughs> what's, what's morally right. Right. Um, and I, I just think it was a really, it was a very, very, um, Christine Anglish wrote the, 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 the skit um, and just a, a really clever uh, way to approach a subject that, uh, that needs to be, and it, I, I just think it could do a lot with it in, in comedy yeah. and it showed, I mean, the response I got from people was just, really impressed with the nature of the piece and how we made people laugh and you know also kind of hopefully made them talk about it made them talk about it without being too preachy you right. know but but made them laugh made them think a little bit about you know just holding up a mirror which is what i think that amy's doing so well on that show it's right ridiculous now. it's just you know it's, it's other level just her and jesse klein and all those writers in there and like christine and it's it's a great group of people, and yeah. um, and Amy's such a great actor and a great scene partner, and really cares about the people around her and and making sure that everyone feels comfortable. I, I love going and playing over there with them. Yeah. So. How did you first uh, run into the to the Amy Schumer world? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think, I mean, I knew Jesse Klein uh, for a while because she Jesse wrote on because she wrote on. Michael and Michael have issues, and Michael Showalter and Mike Black, and I know those guys from Stella, and so it's just a whole connection. And I think, you know, they reached out to me about doing a skit last year. I mean, the, was it the second season when we did the food room? Yeah. And I had already been watching the show and been a huge fan, and so I jumped right at it. And, yeah. then, and we just hit it, really hit it off. I think Amy and I became friends. I love her sister, and just a great, tight-knit group around her. And, and so um, I did one more that year. I would I would have done as many as I as I could have. I was still working on The Good Wife at the time, so we had to sort of find the sure. the moments uh, where I had a day off. But uh, and then this year, uh, last yeah, this past year, they asked me to do that. And I was 
I mean, she sent it to me, and I was like, and like, you know, yeah. before I even read it, I was just like, and she knows I, I would do anything for her. And I reacted the same way. She said, I'm doing a 12 Angry Men parody, but they're, they're deliberating whether or not I'm good looking enough to be on yeah. television. <laughs> it's a and I said, I'm in. Yeah. And then I couldn't do it because of uh, a giant movie, but. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it works with the finger. You got, just <laughs> That's the driving thing. the train behind the joke. We went to see a stand-up the other, a stand-up show the other night that two of our friends were in, and this guy drove the train behind the joke every time, which is a Bob Hope version would be. But I got to tell you, behind every punchline, yeah, yeah. it's a little protection. Dennis Miller, in every special you you've ever seen him, you don't even realize it. After every joke, will say, "But I," after every punchline. And it's this weird mechanism of I'm not secure enough to just let the joke sit there. Mm. And then it goes to the next level, which is part of the rhythm yeah. of the why it's funny. Well, they, I mean, they, I just think over there, they're... Crazy oh, good. Crazy good. Yeah. Fun. And it's fun for me, like, just selfishly for me, like, to get in, involved in that club. It feels great because, you know, I love doing comedy and, and you spend a lot of time doing more dramatic stuff. And it, as you know, in, in any career, you've got to constantly have to show people... Yeah. other sides of yourself. People say, well, this is what you do, and you do this. And they're like, well, you know, I do this, too. And so it's really fun, and I'm really thankful for them for giving me that opportunity. Yeah, no First, shit. because I enjoy it, and B, because it just, you know, helps remind people that you do more than one thing. You yeah, know? that you started as a 10-year-old stand-up, for fuck's sake, <laughs> doing Richard Pryor impression. Not a particularly good one, but <laughs> well, a stand-up Neither was Sam Levine. You know, I have, oh! we have photographs of him from Wait, how Carolines. old is Sam now? 62? Uh-huh. <laughs> We have a photograph in the documentary of Sam from Caroline's on stage when he was about 12 or 13. I think 14, but yeah. Oh, it was a 14, yeah. I think so. Um, we all know what's right, but what can you shed light on about what's wrong with Michael Ian Black? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> we, I can repeat. We all know what's right. <laughs> it might be my favorite question I've ever been asked. <laughs> it uh, might be my favorite question I've ever been asked. Um, God, I want to so badly make fun. Well, I, I went to camp with, with Mike Black. Mm -hmm. um, and whose real Jewish name is? Schwartz. Mm -hmm. um, but I, lo I love Mike Black. I mean, he's so, first of all, I, I really do. I mean, I, well, what's we wrong, all do. But what's wrong with him? What's wrong with him? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, he was on Twitter, like, sort of crushing Delta or somebody a couple weeks ago because his flight was delayed and... And then somehow, maybe through the celebrity angle, they were going to like give him, refund him, or give him a free ticket. But he decided he was going to step up for the whole, the whole plane of, of regular folk. Uh, <laughs> so I think I, I wrote something about like you know Delta just realized that Mike Lee and Black is the Norma Ray of, of our generation. <laughs> but I, I love you know what I don't know I, I, what's wrong with him. I mean I guess. <laughs> What's wrong with him was that he, he once was really mean to this one kid in camp, and right. him and another friend did something really mean to this kid. And, uh, and that's it. Other than that, <laughs> there's a lot right about Mike Black. He's incredibly one of the smartest people I know. I love his writing. Uh, I think he's really funny. And he's, a, he's, a, he's just a really brilliant dude. It's unbelievable, and it's hardly fair to the others if you ask me how brilliant he actually is. Fair to which others? Just all of us in general? And Everyone Earth? who tries to be funny. Yeah, he's... It's he's, not really fair. Well, I think it's because he's so smart. Yeah. So I've really, I've actually been enjoying watching him kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe, um, over, you know, delicate issues, like, you know, issues, you know, with, with people on Twitter, about the Confederate flag, yes. or what have you. And he's just... He finds you know, the way. He's, he's really a brilliant guy. Yeah, yeah I love Michael. Um, I'll talk shit about him in private, but I'm, I don't really, you know... Let's talk about uh, being a new pop and fixing the mistake your old man clearly made. Um, you have, I've told you this to your face and in front of him, the coolest dad uh, that's ever lived on the planet. But, but at what age do you become aware of that, of how cool uh, Alan Charles is? Are you like five, six? I mean, first of all, you have to understand what cool means. Yeah. Right? And then you, even when you go through the awkward years, was he still cool? Yeah, he was always cool. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I've always sort of grown up knowing that he, I, I mean, he was always interested in, like, music that other dads weren't interested in. And like? I, you know, at the time, I don't know what it was. I mean, I mean, he was into the police before people were into the police, and, you know, 
and uh, men at work, you know, before. I mean, he always had the albums and stuff that, that, that I was maybe just about to find out or he was right there with me. Yeah. It was hard to shock him, you know, because you know, if you want to rebel, I mean, I would say it's like he kind of was cool and got it all. Yeah. Um, but Did he turn you on to Pryor or you found Pryor on your No, own? I don't think he... Uh, that's a good question. I don't really know how, how I got turned on to Pryor. I feel like it was... I think I may have just gotten a tape or uh, an album at, at uh, Chick's Record Store in, sure. in Mount Washington, where I grew up in Baltimore. It's this cool record store, and I, I feel like I, I picked up something there. And then, the, and then, of course, the movies. So, I mean, I was really obsessed with Richard Pryor. It became more of an obsession. Um, and, but but the, just to say about my dad, he was a, 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 great, a great father. Uh, I think gave me a lot of freedom. And... Um, you know, now that I am just newly becoming a father, I realize that, like, with a lot of that freedom, you know, you, you comes a lot of responsibility. And there's a lot of things my dad, you know, allowed me to do that I don't know that I'll do with my son. Like, I just may, I may be a little stricter. Uh, <laughs> but I want to try to keep that spirit there because I really do feel like... Um, He's a guy at play. Yeah, I mean, like, the one, I mean, one story that I love best about my dad is that when I went to, I guess I was in fourth grade, I was in Mount Washington Elementary School, and I was doing comedy at the time. Like, I What does doing, that mean, at fourth grade? I don't know, how old are you in fourth grade? Seven, uh, eight, You're ten. turning 10, yeah. Ten. Yeah, that's, Nine, that's, ten. A, that's exactly the age I was. I was just about to go to, to camp for the first time, and I was doing- It's a big deal, because you're getting into the double digits. That's right. There you go, that's double D's. Yeah. And so, and so I had a, a teacher at the show and tell day, and she really wanted us to, uh, to do she had heard that I had been doing some comedy at a local open mic night, and so at she. age ten. I know, but this, this, look, this, <laughs> I'm jumping the, the ahead of the story here, but but she she uh, she really insisted that she wanted me to, to to perform for the kids, and I said, because I was a real smart ass and and totally like you know, I said. Um, I don't, you know, I think my act's a little risque. I don't think I should do it. <laughs> and she really insisted. She's like, no, no, you should do it. You should do it. I was like, I really don't think I should. This happened. She asked me to do it. I tried to back out of it. She said, no, do it. And, and then your opening bit was? <laughs> you haven't noticed? No, I mean, I don't know. But I was like, it's a shortage of white people. You don't stop fucking. No, it wasn't, that, it wasn't that extreme, but it was definitely something like, I definitely realized I had a, you know, I, I probably pushed it a little bit more because I had said to her I shouldn't do it. So she sent me to the principal's office. <laughs> this is a true story. And uh, because I said some, I don't know, either a dirty joke or whatever. And my dad had to come pick me up and, and have this meeting with the principal. And my dad just laid into them like I've never seen anything in my life. He just said, you know, my son is an artist. And he told her that he didn't think that he should do this. And she insisted, and so he went up and he did his art, and how dare you try to squash that? And I mean, or like, censor it. and she totally backed down. And I mean, I never did it again, obviously, in school. But it was because it was a real hero moment for my dad. I just, I, because I didn't know, like, at the time, I was Are like, you am I going to get in trouble? Yeah. Or, you know, you're a kid. And I'm like, maybe I pushed it. I don't know. But my dad totally had my back. But he was great like that. He's, he's a great dad. And you know what? More importantly, I mean, he, he's never missed any play I've ever done around the country, you know. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of plays in like regional theaters and... Um, That's one of the things I remember most fondly about my dad coming to see me perform live. I got an email from my uncle Jerry, one of the greatest uncles anyone's ever had. Like, put, he was the one who put me in his lap when I was five with my hands on the steering wheel and drove the car, Uncle Jerry. But he said, he said, I just had this memory of getting into your, my, your, you were opening up for Marilyn McCoo at Caesars in Lake Tahoe. I must have been like 19 years old. And he said, and your dad asked me if I wanted to go and we piled into his 66 Volkswagen Bug and we drove to Lake Tahoe. And there was so much snow on the way home. It From San us, Francisco. Yeah, it took us 22 hours to get home. <laughs> That's and I, said, <laughs> I said, I do remember a little bit about hearing that story, but thank God he reminded me That's great. of the ridiculousness of that. Because, yeah. I so mean, it would be like if we decided to drive the Tesla from San Francisco to Lake Tahoe, it would take 22 hours because we'd need to stop and charge it 100 times. Do you sense that she didn't enjoy driving the Tesla to Vegas last weekend because of the stopping and charging it? Is that what you just. How many times did you have to stop and charge twice. it? Twice. Well, technically, twice. But really only once. I chose the second Twice. one just to make it safely. I thought you didn't need to do it that. that. Well, first of all, you got a couple hundred miles. 
but those aren't real miles, and also you don't want to run out, run out. Yeah, of course. So we got down to about there. So where do you have to stop? Like in Barstow or something? Yeah, halfway. In Prim. And where do you charge it? They have Tesla Station, and by the way, it's free. Where you, where you guys are and how long does filling it take? up an your hour? cars. It was an hour, right at the factory outlets. We Not walked around. Not a fan around. of that. Not a fan of that. Not a fan. <laughs> Not a fan of the hour. Not a fan of the hour 10 Not minutes. Not a fan of the environment. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, why do you hate the environment so much? I just hate that car. <laughs> I love that car. Yeah, it tried well, to break my hand off. But it tried to kill my best but friend. But the, the genius of that car is more for like being local, though, right? I mean, that's like yeah. for long distance. I mean, eventually it will get to a point where. Well, he has charging stations across the country. But the truth is, it is an hour and ten minutes each time you stop and charge. Yeah. And you got to factor that into your. To it's your like life. having a baby. It's the same thing. You got to stop. There you go. It's like having nope. Um, and by the way, the second time we stopped was like twenty minutes. We barely had enough time to eat. We stopped in Prim one last time before we drove in. Yeah. Um, oh, it was a good spot. Did you ever, you ever stop at the... We stopped coming back at uh, Mad Peggy Sue's Diner. See, so yeah. we wanted to stop. I've always wanted to stop. We started to stop at the Mad Greek. We ate at the Mad Greek, which is something, another sign you see every oh, yeah. fucking time. What was the Peggy Sue's? It was cool. It was a classic 50s? There's a military base, I think, right across from there. And, um, yeah, and it was, it was great. It was, yeah, it was classic 50s diner. We just had some, some breakfast and uh, got back on the road. Was that in Baker? Gas. What town is it? It's right... Just outside? It's right before you get to... Um, Prim. No. No, uh, Baker. The, not Baker, the, the one we were just saying. Uh, Barstow. Between Bar Barstow. Yeah. Barstow. It's the town Barstow just past Baker, Barstow if you're going nothing. towards Vegas. Okay. It's called Yerma, I think I want to say. Does that sound right, Yerma? Mm -hmm. Let's say yes. I'm going to say it's true. Absolutely. Um, how old does Six. your son have to be before he's safely allowed to attend a Ravens game? <laughs> Six might be. Yeah, Pittsburgh doesn't want to hear about the yeah. Ravens. Um, Six might be the answer. I, no. It's, uh, Ravens? You know what? This is a, this is a conversation. I, it's funny because I've had other friends in the, in the city who grow up and their teams are elsewhere because they didn't grow up in New York. And what am I going to do you know, if, if, if he doesn't want to support the Ravens and, you know, if he's a Giants fan? If he grows up in New York. the Jets. Right, and, and I, you know... Is he I, not born in New York? He's born in New York, and it's possible, but I, I think what... I think I can stack the deck. Yeah, you can. Pretty heavily. <laughs> um, and what I have a whole plan in place. My plan is, you know, when appropriate, start taking him to training camp, start taking him to the castle, as they call it in Baltimore, and meeting some of the players. And, you know, at an early age, so that he associates things that, you know, he's not going to get that opportunity in a giant stadium or right. the Jets. Not that I probably couldn't make it happen, but I'm not going to make no, it No, you're not. I'm going to make it happen here. That's right. So it's a couple hours I'll do everything in my, and then whatever he wants. You know, and he may not even like football. So who knows? You know, he may be into skateboarding and soccer. And yeah. I don't know. But uh, the only thing is, the, the one that would be hardest, honestly, if he was a Giants or Jets, I really, that would if he loved Steelers I would have a big problem with. <laughs> that would be a problem. That would be a, that would be a big problem. Of course. Um, and Yankees would be a big problem. Like Mets, you know, I could live with. Nah. But but if we're there, and I mean, if he's got, you know, he has to be Mets. It can't. The, the Yankees would be that. Be that would be really tough for me. That would be really really hard. Yeah. And I'll do everything in my power to make sure that doesn't happen. Why won't you take? Why won't you take him to Disneyland? I, who said that? I never said that. All right, just checking. <laughs> um, Are they a sponsor of this <laughs> podcast? For fuck's sake, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> What was that? What's that drink that I just heard on NPR? The famous or famous dessert that they have at Disneyland? You're gonna have to give me a little more than that. Well, well there's a premium bar, which is an ice cream bar in the shape of Mickey's head that you can only get on. But it's called something. It's got a name to it. There's like a, it's You're like gonna a. Gonna have to. They oh, just the, did, they just did this whole thing outside now. the Tiki Room. Oh, the Dole Whip. Dole yeah. Whip. Dole oh, Whip. Yeah, it's just it's it, it's pineapple frozen yogurt. Okay, all right. Well, you don't need to yell at me. That was just something I heard on the radio, <laughs> no, and I was, I, just, uh, I was just checking into it. because I, I, I don't uh, He really brought up understand. Disneyland. I don't understand. I'm, I'm actually, like, I do enjoy a Dole Whip. I just don't understand, like, the mass appeal of it, and it's always, like, this 30-minute wait to get one, and it's, oh, yeah. like, it's, it's true. pineapple frozen yogurt. It's and not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you've got Mickey in an Maybe ice cream bars, bar. Yeah, There's so I many mean, other guys, treats there. We, I think you guys, we have to do this before I leave, right? We have to take my, my little guy to Disneyland. Yeah. Right? You guys are into it. We'll do it as a group, right? Let's yes. do that. I get yeah. to go twice this week. 
Yeah. Really? Yeah. Done. I'm going. Corey and I are going to a birthday party on Thursday. That's at the Mickey Mouse Penthouse Suite awesome. at the Disneyland Hotel, and True then we story. get to go. On and I think Sunday. so. At what point does the alarm start going off on the podcast for the Nerd Meter? Is that, <laughs> I mean, we're kind of probably right up there at it's five every minutes week. right now. It's every week. Yeah, specifically Disneyland. Uh, let's talk more about Stage Door Manor Performing Arts Training Center. Didn't know that was the full title until this particular <laughs> dossier How do you got feel about that? put together. It's uh, not where I want to send my ten-year-old. First of all, Stage Door Manor Performing Arts Training Center. Speaking of nerd alert. Yeah, you can't call it a camp. You can't call it a camp. Yeah, I. Why can't you call it a camp? Well, no, you can, but I mean, that w the, What that, did you that think was it was joke. when you were going? A Stage camp? Door Manor Camp. Yeah, yeah, it was a camp. But this is what it was called because it was Performing a. Performing Arts Training Center. I don't want my kids going to a training center, first of all. Well, really? Training center? I mean, that's kind of what, if they go to a, like a baseball or soccer camp, it's a training center, technically. You said it? camp. I like the word camp. No, camp's better. I'm yeah. with you. No, yeah. and it was camp. To me, it was always camp. Yeah. Stage door manor, camp. I mean, that was it. But, but I think it's because it, it attracts a lot of kids who are very serious about it. And I think that's, I, I don't actually know why they ended up calling it that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure I could find out pretty quickly. But I would say this, that it's, it's a place that, um, yeah, my mom found it in the, the back of the New York Times magazine, which is how a lot of people found it at that time. And around 1981, I guess she was looking and, and said, hey, this place, I was in a theater and I was doing comedy at the time and I was doing a lot of like local plays and I just had a real passion for acting early on. And she was like, this place looks interesting. And she got the, the brochure from it. It was this fancy brochure where you took like video classes and, and learned how to do makeup and costumes and you acted and you got to take all these classes and perform in plays. And, it, 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 you know, there was a pool. There was two pools, an indoor and outdoor pool. And they had tennis court and all this stuff. I was like, this looks like my dream place. So I went for three weeks. Uh, I'd never been to sleepaway camp. It was 1982. My parents had just divorced. And so I, I literally, like, left um, elementary school, drove to our house, which was right near the elementary school, where my parents were. My dad was moving away. My mom was moving somewhere else. Grabbed my stuff. We went to, to my dad's new house, and then the next day, uh, I was driving uh, to camp. I was going up to camp. So I like got my stuff in the new house, went to camp. And I'd never been to camp, but I was really excited about going to this camp. And I got there, and this is obviously way before cell phones or anything. This is 1982. And uh, barely had rodeo done. Yeah, they had like a little room that you could call, like, you know, calling cards or whatever you could call on the pay phones. And I remember calling my dad, I think the first day I got there, or as soon as they let you use the phone, maybe the next day, crying. You I gotta like, get me out of here. I don't wanna be here, I hate this place. This is like, I, don't, I didn't like it at all. And then I think in the course of the next day and a half, God I, met, I met my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I met my friends, and some of which are, are some of my best friends to this day, and found a bunch of kindred spirits that were all really passionate about the arts. And, you know, just uh, we all found each other at this place and these, this group of gypsies. And it's, like I said, some of my best friends this day. And then it shifted and my dad checked in with me about a day later and I said, no, I, I, not only do I love it, I, can I stay for the rest of the summer? And uh, he asked the camp, you know, was there space available? And they were always looking for guys there because they had an abundance of girls and, and they didn't have as many guys. The That's ratio, one of the things I think John Cryer said is that there was... Oh, the ratio was insanely... I mean, it was like four to one. So I think they were like, sure, he can stay. And, uh, and I stayed the entire summer and I went back four more summers. And that was how I got my first manager in the business. Like I said, I met all my best friends, my first crushes. Everything was there. Why do I picture the Jew manager in his 50s with a cigar the standing around the camp grounds? Hey, you. With the banjo, get over here. <laughs> Listen, I saw you... With uh, the banjo? <laughs> I saw you at the cookout uh, <laughs> earlier. <laughs> you had just finished the canoe races. <laughs> and, so uh, sweet kid. <laughs> you gotta like do that look. What's that look you do to the side? Just yeah. do that look. That's my favorite look. Let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite thing is when Kevin, when you hold a joke and you just do that look to the side. Yeah, Jamie, there's a dog that makes that face. Looks at that. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet kid. Sweet kid. Uh, Very special place, though, by the way. And in, in fact, a ridiculous. It, it, it's the, the talent that's come out of that Robert place. I know Downey you just. Junior. Yeah, I know you talked to to Cryer about it. I think I even gave you one of the questions for him. Um, 
Skylar Aston, who was here recently. It's been yeah. going on generation after generation. It's it's a, it's an amazing place. Do you guys um, go back to? Yeah, often. I haven't been lately, uh, but a, a good friend of of uh, my wife and I's, uh, their daughter just went um, and had an amazing time. She went for three weeks and she loved it and just felt like she she said it felt like home, and I knew exactly what she meant. It was a really special place. Uh, it changed my life you know, without any question. Um, I just just to be around people that were like you know when you had this sort of burning weird desire that you were like I really am into this but in school not everybody was and so nobody like looked down or it wasn't like I was beat up for it <laughs> like I like acting <laughs> shut up <laughs> but it was more but you know suddenly you're in a place where like you know uh, you know actors and who, who like uh, people were responding to that in a way that they would respond to the star football player and I was an athlete too in school but I I just had this other passion that I was really serious about and yeah. it felt great to connect with people who felt the same way well no in school my experience was segregated very drama freaks yeah the jocks and never show the two meet until a little funny Jew who could connect with any group because he was a little ham bone, would be in a horrible production of Godspell, because that was a prerequisite. Okay. And then the jocks would be crying in the front row, and then, you know. Is there a VHS somewhere of you doing Godspell? Thank God. No. God, please tell oh, me there is. I've got God. it. Yeah, <laughs> Corey's got you, it. You left out one thing. Like a funny Jew who was in Godspell who was also a bocce ball expert. So you <laughs> did have some athletic talent, and you were able to sort of bridge the gap. I'll have you know. <laughs> That I was. Weren't six, you like the midget basketball league? Six men. I they had C and D basketball when I was a kid. <laughs> midget. That's just. That's it's true though. She knows. She, um, this is from a story I yeah. told her. So they had something called C and D basketball that was specifically designed for shorter kids. <laughs> the D's up to five five. If you were taller than five five, you could not play in D basketball. The C's was up to five ten. <laughs> Which, by the way, you should have been playing in varsity if you were 5'10". <laughs> Amazing but story. The basket, by the way, these programs don't exist anymore. And it's hilarious, <laughs> and it's easy to make fun of me because of it, but I will tell you, as a 5'4 high school junior, yeah. to be able to compete and travel on a bus and play teams from other towns, amazing. the same t teams that the varsity was playing, That's amazing. you felt you were part of a fucking group. Absolutely. I mean, honestly, where else is a 5'4 kid going to play basketball? You got video of that? <laughs> <laughs> Never this happened is, until I could see it. I being, gotta see that. Of being my age. God, that would be There's amazing. There's only Super 8 it, films. Just to see your little ass running up, dribbling <laughs> the ball, I would give i give a thousand dollars for it right now. By the now. way, in Jamie's mind, I literally was a midget. Hey, what are you, you put me in the game? <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> we want the man. You know, I mean, what are you singing the put lollipop song? I can hit the, the three-pointer. It wasn't a three-pointer. <laughs> and why did he sound like Regis Philbin? I don't know what just happened there. <laughs> That's the Lullaby League, they call that, right? Are you ready for this? So anyway. <laughs> um, very early on, slowly, shortly after camp, was an opportunity to work with the Baltimore Zone John Waters. Yeah. The 1988. 80, you were still a teenager. Was it 88? We made it. No, it was 86, I think. Right. 88, probably the release date. Yeah. Uh, the original Hairspray. He would remake his own film. 15. Um, you were 15 in a movie. He didn't remake it. I mean, they remade it. They remade it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, yeah, yeah, it was 15. And I read for it. I, in fact, I was, I, was, I was spending the summer up with my buddy David Quinn from New York and, uh, for a month, and I was auditioning for stuff um, and also working. My dad was a commercial director, and he, his editing house that, that he worked with here, they let me, gave me a job as like an assistant, basically a funky. I'd go and do whatever they asked me to do. So I would do that, and I would, I would go every day, walk down there and work, and then they let me off or do auditions and things like that. And I went and auditioned for it in New York, funny enough, but then got it, and it was fun. It was, it was a, a hell of a first movie to do. I didn't have a lot to do in it other than dance, and I had one line, which was asking Ricky Lake if she would, um, if she would swim in an integrated swimming pool. That was my first line in the movie, and that was fun. Right. And John was great. And, and you're on the set of a movie for the first time in that? First time. Met my, my buddy John Orfino, who you've met, uh, Johnny O, and I met on that. Um, stayed in, on location at Dorney Park in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And was Do you there know a, it? You know it? Allentown's like in the middle of the state. It is yeah. in the middle. Was there a sense, though, when you were on the movie set of belonging? Because I remember the very first time. I wasn't 15, but I was still... Yeah. 
I don't know. You know, it's a good, it's a good question. I, I, for me, like I felt like because my dad directed commercials, I, I grew up on sets. So the idea of being on a set wasn't so far right. to me. It, it did feel like home, but that was kind of because that's how I grew up. I was always PAing for him and, you know, PAing, I mean, yeah. you know, hanging out craft service, like doing whatever they told me to do. But m since I was a little kid, so, and he'd throw me in commercials all the time. So I felt very comfortable around sets and well, knew no what everybody's job was and, 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 you know, and felt like all the people that worked for my dad were like, they were like my extended family. I see them all the time. So was there a sense of a form of graduation that it was no longer on your dad's world, it was in a world that you had gotten. Yeah, I, I mean, I felt like that was, I mean, what was really cool about that was, you know, I was 15 and I was staying in like the George Washington Motel and like on location for a week, like being on location for a week at this little motel. Without supervision. Yeah, I guess so, yeah, yeah. That's how cool dad was. Well, I mean, I think he may have come up, but um, yeah, it was, it was like, it was crazy, fun. it was fun. Um, I want to get to the famous questions I threatened earlier because I feel like there's potential gold in them thar heels. Oh boy. Yep. Um, let's start with Sam Levine, since we were kind enough to uh, shit on him. make him a part of the show. I mean, shit on him. I am sorry, Sam. Well, he knows how much, how fond of him you are. And I'm not... <laughs> Let's not push it. I, mean, I, I don't know about that. I'm not crazy about that. I owe him some money. Yeah. Sam Levine writes, Josh, over the years, you and Josh Molina have engaged in quite a few pranks with one another. But there's a particular one involving the Marx Brothers that you ultimately decided was too awful. Please share in great detail how that prank was supposed to go down. Oh, my God. That was... That's true. This is one that Josh and I used, I used to play a lot of pranks on each other. Although him more than me. I mean, he's an evil fuck. Let's just be honest. I love him to death, but he's dark. He has a reputation. And he took it up another notch. And, uh, and so there was one where he got me, and then I had this one. It, I had sort of just thought of this whole idea, and I concocted it because I, I flew back to New York once, and I sat next to this director. And, he, and, and I was telling him about it, and he got excited about it, and I was gonna have my friend write the script. And the, 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 the joke is this, because I've told Josh now, so he knows I kind of ruined it in a weak moment where I thought he was you know, nice again years later. And, um, but th it was gonna go like this. Josh is obsessed with, with Groucho Marx and always felt like he should play him in a movie. And so what I was gonna do was- <laughs> Have a director? Was have a, have a major director. I'm going to leave this guy out of the story because he's also kind of a dick. So I'm going to leave him out of the story. <laughs> but but he he was going to he was going to pretend that he was directing the movie, and my friend was going to write it, and it was going to be something that the the director was going to reach out to him directly and say the studio wants me to cast X Y and Z. I really want to fill the movie. You know. I don't want to do that because I just don't think Groucho will be best served that way and I want to fill the movie with a lot of big stars in all the supporting roles so that I can cast really who I want. You're really the person I want for it. But I, we, we've got to sort of fight this fight and you know, I want to give you these scenes ahead of time because I have to sort of put you on tape and oh you know, hope that you can, you know, and of course he was going to say yes. <laughs> um, and he was going to, these scenes were going to be absurd. Sure. They were going to run the gamut of, he, he was gonna have to do the impossible. I mean, such extreme drama, such extreme comedy, silliness in a way that nobody could pull it off. Whatever we were gonna write was gonna be something that he was going to look foolish doing it. And so he would come in, he would do that. He would commit to it. He would commit to that. And the director would be in touch with him and say, let me, you know, fight the fight. And then I was gonna take those audition tapes and put them on a website that I had created called IHateJoshMolina.com. <laughs> With a little picture of my face in the corner, like, you know, like Odin Kirk and Van Hammersley, you know, for Mr. Show, just like, <laughs> where I just, and it just, maybe, maybe it's like a GIF or whatever you call it, it just keeps going like this. No, well, that would be, that would be perfect. <laughs> that would be to just, yeah, I might not never get And then this side of the thing would be this. <laughs> I might not ever uh, that was my plan, and then just put it on a loop. Yep. And not like just like bombard, but just 
little by little, let everybody know. <laughs> and so that he kind of, he's the butt of the joke before he finds it, and then he would find it. And it was such a great idea, and I had so much fun thinking of all the little versions of it and what we would do and the details. And then I, you know, I, maybe I'm proud of this. I don't live my life like that. And so at a moment, Josh and I, and I said, you know what I was going to get you? And I told him, and then I was like, oh, I shouldn't have told him that. Because it was best served, like if I did it now, it would have been amazing. Yeah. It's like here all we are years 15 later. years later, cold as ice. <laughs> Those are the best ways. And, but you know what? That still may be coming for him. Yeah. We just don't know. Um, it's funny that Sam knows that. I, I guess, did Josh tell Sam that? Was it I? predicated by one of Melina's Oh, God, he did so many. To so you many. that involved a mass emailing of <laughs> your sharing so something very personal? <laughs> yeah, he, he's, he used to use my computer on the set of, of uh, Sports Night. It's like some giant Mac computer that Disney had, like, you know, I don't know, it was in the contract or something. I was, like, just sitting there, and I would use it. And he went on to the AOL page, which he didn't realize I didn't use, was my girlfriend at the time, so it was all her contacts. But he just assumed it was mine. And went on and wrote this huge letter, basically outing myself to them. You were coming out. That I was coming out of the closet. To everyone. It was a pretty funny prank. In hindsight, it was pretty funny. Uh, except it wasn't my friends. It was all these people. So people that I think were like, what the <laughs> fuck? Is this the weirdest what? email to I barely you? know John. I don't know him that well. Why is he writing me an email? He's really so coming I, out. So I, of course, knew it was him. And I was like, I'm going to get you back. And that's where this idea came up. And yeah. it came out of that. He, 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 he's good at the pranks. Here's an example of Melina's love. Because when I w reached out to a handful of celebrities that I, m m that I thought could ask insightful questions to you, okay. here was Melina's. <clears throat> oh, boy. I don't trust this one. There, Josh Charles. You had a kid and quit your job on a hit TV show in the same year. Are you fucking insane? XO Melina. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really ask for more than that. It's pretty great. That is, that is great. true Melina. I love it. Um, <laughs> there's no particular order. So, so Amy Schumer, who we already talked about. Yeah. I don't think she broke a nail when writing this question. I'm just going to put that out there. Best and worst Baltimore story. Okay. That was her question. Okay. So, appreciate that she replied to my email. <laughs> very, very she's much. She's taking over the universe right now. We'll cut her. She's a we'll cut her little some slack. I haven't heard from her in God knows how long. Every magazine. Yeah, I don't. I don't even know. I'm surprised she even was like knows who I am anymore. I was shocked. Yeah. And then that, I realized, oh, that this is ridiculous that she replied to. Yeah. <laughs> for someone who doesn't need to be bothered. <laughs> And is about 37 emails behind every waking minute. <laughs> so best and worst Baltimore story. Best or worst, I'm going to say. She wrote best and worst. Best and worst. See, I'm, Oh, but you know what, though? That's actually not true because Amy, Amy went to college in Baltimore. So ah. she has a Baltimore connection, too. So I, I, I would actually, in defense of her, say that that's a little more thought out than we're giving her credit. Okay. I don't know that she needed defending, but sure. No, not defending, but I mean, we were saying she's There's so actually busy. a connection. I think that that's her thought, because she, she went to Towson, so she, she's got a... She's got a and in fact, the last time I saw her perform was at the Lyric in Baltimore. And, um, Holy crap. Yeah, it was cool. Took my, took my dad. Uh, yeah, we hung out afterwards. It was cool. Well, there's a great Baltimore story right there. That was a blast. It was really fun. Uh, she's incredible live and, and enjoyed it. But uh, Well, I like that she so, asked best and worst, because... Best and worst. As loving your hometown as much as you do. Yeah. Well, the worst story right now would be what, what happened just recently. And, and just with, you know, how, how helpless you feel watching it and, 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 and seeing all these people suffering. And happening in your backyard. Yeah, and just that, that you, you know, I love my city. You know, we just done, a group of us just done a big campaign for the city. Um, and I still believe in the city. Um, I think what's happening in Baltimore is happening in many places around the around the country, and there is a lot of inequality, and and it's up to all of us to not ignore it anymore and to look at the reasons why and what's going on underneath of that. And I think, you know, um, so that was that was probably really hard for me because I was working and I wasn't able to to go home to to see anybody and and just to. To see, you know, my town that I that I grew up in, that I love so much, that's yeah. made so much progress, suffering, and to see people suffering and, and people that that feel like, you know, clearly they're not being heard, and and to not necessarily know what I can do about that, and except to to try to 
to help in any way I can and figure out how, how we can help these communities, how we can help these people, you know, feel 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 heard, feel like they have a future. You mm -hmm. know, I think I think that's the bottom line. You want a sense of pride. Feel, a sense of a sense that they can a sense that they can they can move on in this world, you know, and I think you have a lot of people. Uh, hopelessness is a really you know is, is a bad feeling to have, and I think it, 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 that was a, a real fuel for a lot of the fire there. Yeah, and um, so yeah, I, that that would be the lowest point. I would say this. Uh, what was the story? The worst? That'd be the, the worst in the sense that it also brought out a lot of the best too. You saw a lot of great people in that town and coming together. And, and I still have hope for the city. I mean, I really do. I, I think, well, yeah, the, I think the, the best thing that can happen out of all of that is that, you know, we can, some real change can come out of it. Change between, you know, the local government and the communities, between the police departments you're seeing. I mean, they just, they just fired the, the police chief. And, and maybe that's going to lead to some real dialogue between those communities. Um, and I think the best... I don't know the best story. It's hard to come off a of best story. Well, there'll story be endless. There's no greater segue from what you just shared to Sarah Silverman's question. Oh, boy. There's no greater segue, honestly. What well, was it? Please, Josh, in detail, what is your wiping ritual? <laughs> Thanks in advance, XO Sarah. <laughs> Thanks in advance. That's my favorite part of the whole thing. Can I say? Thanks in advance. Can I, can I, can I, can yes. I answer yes. that question with a story? That's Please. Sarah? And since she opened up the gates there, I feel free to share this. So Literally. Sarah has already been working on Masters of Sex, both last year, this year, and, and I'm doing an arc on it this season. And um, and I guess what happens is, because you know she's working on days, I'm not working, we're not in scenes together, they put her in my trailer and vice versa, right? Ah. So, so she said, she wrote me uh, a text the other day saying, we, looks like we're sharing trailers. So, you know, that was my toothbrush and and, um, and toothpaste and you left your little half uh, drank smoothie and your hard boiled eggs. And I was like, oh, that's sweet. And she's like, but why does my toothbrush smell like your asshole? <laughs> 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 to which I responded, I'm not proud of that. <laughs> it was a bad day. And I think I said, I, I just wanted you to feel my pain. <laughs> And I'm really not proud of it, and I'm sorry, but I, and I said I, I want to go back and change it, but I can't. <laughs> and it's really all about moving forward, and she just wrote back, I understand. <laughs> yeah. I understand. I understand. And that's why I love Sarah Silverman. Yeah. Because she's, she, she, I will say this, you, you lead off questions from Amy and Sarah. This year, for me, I've worked with Sarah, did a movie with Sarah called I Smile Back that you saw that, that was in Sundance that's, that's going to be in, coming out in the fall. Um, I worked on a movie with Tina Fey. Work with Amy again. I just did Wet Hot American Summer, and a lot of my scenes were with Kristen Wiig. And in one year, I got to work with four of these funniest women, incredible talents, killing it, right? And um, I just feel really lucky and blessed, uh, like really special to be able to work with all of them. And just waiting for Polar and Melissa McCarthy and yeah, who else I can Hold add to the list? But I don't know why they're hiding from me. But uh, eventually, I will. I will get them too. But right now, that, that that's just. That's made me feel really special. Yeah. So. Well, it should. Let's talk a little bit about the wet hot. Oh, wait. One last... Uh, oh, question. Uh, from an Academy Award winner. Writes from London, England. Wow. Where he's putting, putting the final touches. Oh, of a little Chris. film that will Wish. be known as MI5. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Who asks... This is Christopher McQuarrie. When I wasn't fixing your computer over the phone at 4 a.m., I was lecturing you about committing to a damn TV series. How do you look back on your time on The Good Wife, and is that why you don't call me for help with your computer anymore? <laughs> Chris McCory, yep. Academy Award-winning screenwriter and now fancy director, was basically my Apple tech advisor. He was your IT guy. And I always said that we should yeah, do a, Oscar, we should do a and you on the yeah, phone. and we should do a <laughs> we should do a funny or die skit of him as because he was the meanest tech person. <laughs> I mean, he literally because he knew he would help me, and he was always busy, but he would help me. But he did it in such a mean way. I mean, I have to imitate him because he would be like. Uh, we'd be on the phone, or I'd be like, Chris, this fucking thing. He's like, shut the fuck up and do what I tell you to do. <laughs> Just shut the fuck up. But Chris, I'm doing. Shut your fucking mouth right now. <laughs> Press this button, and then. But I'd already. Shut the fuck up. 
just shut up. Press this. Do. And that's how he would talk to me. That was our relationship with Apple. Anytime I had a problem, like, fuck them, don't call them. And then he would just curse at me and tell me to shut up and do what he said. And then he would like, and then when remote came over and he would take over my computer, he'd be like, just back your fucking hands away from the computer and let me just take over. And then he would like, he'd be fucking with my computer. He's a genius with computers. He really is. And he, um, he always helped me. So, so there's that. And he helped my wife too. But now I don't know. I don't, but, but. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Computer wise. Oh, okay. But I never, it never, but the, I don't remember his advice about TV because the, I worked with him on a TV series. So I don't even know what the hell he's talking about. Yeah. We did a TV show together, me, you, and him. So. That's right. Yeah. I don't know what he's talking about. I think it was his way of getting at the computer thing. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about the wet hot first because that's also the future. And then we can talk as he's insisted about the good way. Because um, I know, I'm sure a lot of, of your fans have been sitting through the first 47 minutes wondering if you were going to talk about the good way um, of the 17 people watching right now. Uh, what, pretty, well, I, pretty certain it's... I'm unbelievably 90. excited about the Wet There's Hot. There's 90. What, the Wet Hot series? <laughs> 90. <laughs> yeah, nobody watches anything live. Well, we'll do 20 to 40,000 downloads in the first 10 days. But, but so Wet Hot as a Netflix series... Yes. Debuts. I know we're going to some screening of the yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah. You're going to go? I, I hope I Maybe. Can make it. If you're not working? Yeah. Because it's like in the middle of the week or something. Yeah. They're screening all of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a casting crew. It's like eight game. episodes, ten episodes? Eight. Eight episodes. It's a prequel to the movie. Right. That's very exciting. I mean, it's, you know, those are all my friends, and I was not in the movie. I think I was living in LA at the time. I don't know, but I, they asked me to do it, and Michael had, Showalter had told me that they had this me in mind for this role and uh, we play these sort of rival campers uh, at the um, at the preppy tiger claw camp where was it shot it was shot out uh, out here in like Calabasas area in, in Malibu canyons sure um, and it just sounded like too much fun and right. I got to uh, play a, a real prep prick douchey with a my favorite part when I knew how <laughs> it was our costume fitting, and Show Walter came to the to the fitting, and I'm, we were gonna do like a double popped collar, and Show's like, triple popped. Triple popped. And so we we're like, I was like, awesome. That's <laughs> such a great idea. And then we I had seen we, the triple we had to have them sew it in because otherwise the shirt would have been just too thick. Yeah. So we had uh, we had all three of it. It was it was pretty great look. Yeah. <laughs> Who else is in your? It's me and Rick Rich Sumner. Group. Rich Sumner. Um, who else? Uh, Rich Chris, Sumner. We love the Rich Sumner. He's been on this show. The best. Yeah. Nice guy. Uh, Kristen Wiig. And um, yeah, that was. She went to the prick camp also, Kristen Wiig. Yeah, we're all. Yeah, we're all like. Uh, Tiger. We're Claw? the preppies. Yeah. Really funny. In fact, there's some picture someone took uh, of all of us while we were shooting, and I've got like a high lie, like. Uh, no. Like. You know what do you call it? A mitt? I don't even know what you call mitt it. Mitt mallet? Yeah, ma I'm like holding no, it in my be hand. A scoop. It's like a scoop. Yeah. A scoop. Amazing. I just grabbed it off of the prop trick and I was like, <laughs> 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 they play highlight. But it was Tiger Claw. Uh, hundred. I mean, I worked on some Stella videos with those guys, and I did uh, Wayne Days with David. So sure. there's just a kind of madness to it all, and it it you know it was an absolute blast. I mean. It was a scheduling marvel that they were able to get all that original cast together and then work everybody else's schedule. So, you know, I think I'm in all eight of the episodes, but I did all that stuff in like a couple weeks. So. Holy crap. Yeah, which I think, you know. They did bring they back did. everyone. Yeah, every single person. That's crazy. Bradley Cooper, Rudd. Bradley Amy. Cooper to your Kenny Marino. Love me some Kenny Marino. Love I was just Kenny about Marino. to say that two, it probably easily top two favorite weddings I've ever been to was yours. Yeah. And then our friends Joe Latrulio and Beth Dover because they, the guests, it was the same guests. It was like, but their wedding yeah, was after yours and it was like Josh Charles wedding part two. But yeah. it was like all the same because it was all like Show the wet hunt. Yeah, it was like Michael and Michael and David yeah. Wayne and yeah. Ken Marino. It, it was fun. all the same. It was so much fun. That's cool. Yeah, I love those guys. I love Ken Marino. God, he is funny. It's, it's not uh, fair. He's so funny. Quite frankly. I mean, I was telling people, people on set were talking about The Bachelor the other day, and I was like, have you not seen Burning Love? And they were like, no. And I was like, you have to. I mean, that's a brilliant performance. Stop what you're doing. Yeah. He's pretty amazing. Um, and and Eric, also, and his and wife wrote it. I mean, they're incredible, yeah. two of them. So. And at the KC thing for Rudd and yeah. Sadek's K 
Ken Marino, when they went from the poker tournament to the bowling tournament, decides, I'll just bowl 180, because I felt like it. Like it was no big whoop. That's not a big deal, 180. <laughs> What's your average? 210? I, I, bowl, I, bowl, I almost bowled a perfect game. No, you didn't? I bowled a 244. What are you talking about? Peter Krause, as my witness, was with me and signed the card. I, I bowled a two. But it sounds like you're able to acknowledge it was fucking ridiculously cool and amazing. I don't. 180 is nothing. I'm not that. <laughs> I, I, I just said Ken Marino's brilliant. I'm not going to blow him for 180. I don't think that's that impressive. <laughs> that's not bad, of course. But you know, if he was in the 200s, I'd say, oh, he bowled a 210. That's good. I 180. See. I mean, he like, not even a minor chub. Do it for you? Not even a minor chub. You have to close every single frame in order to get 200 plus. Yeah. It's hard. Well, we used to go to Hollywood Star Lanes, and I, I was the, the, when I bowled the 244, I, I finally got my own ball, and they like mm -hmm. fitted my hand to it. Oh, yeah. And then I went and bowled, and all my friends were there, and Peter, we were, and it was like I was rolling every time a strike, and then I finally, I don't know, I petered out at the end, had a spare or whatever, but it was, I almost got there. I, was, I had like, I don't know, six, seven strikes in a row or something like that. It was crazy. Yeah. I was on fire. It's a bizarre sport in that regard, isn't it? And I don't spin. I was going straight, like yeah, just right I'm down a, the middle, like. No I'm a straight down the power speed. Down the oh really? That's my agent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to ask about. Um, oh, jo <laughs> what was Josh's question? What did he say? Having oh, having a kid and leaving. Have a kid and leaving uh, the good wife. Yeah. So we'll circle back to the good wife. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to forget this. Someone remind me of this. How did the great Alan Charles boombox save the day for Peter Weir? I thought that was an interesting story yeah. on the dead poets. Yeah, yeah. That is cool. Because my, my dad, like I said, was a commercial director. So he, and he was always on top of like what to have on set. And he had this cool like new Bose uh, boombox that you could put like a CD in. Which at the really, time was. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, I mean, it's was just like a really good quality one. And uh, Peter Weir liked to, liked to play a lot of music on set scenes and I just thought that was really cool it was a great way to set the mood for the scene the tone and just kind of keep it in the background and and so for that he was listening to a, of the mission yeah he was listening to a lot exactly he was listening to a lot of Morricone uh, and you know Morricone uh, soundtracks and music and that that one from the mission he was playing quite a bit and uh, but he you know it's, it's a terrible little system so my dad had this thing and said, you want it? And he used it. And so when we shot the, um, I'm pretty sure it was there. He let, he let them just keep it in the, uh, in the truck while, they, while we were shooting. And, and the, the music from the mission was playing while we were standing on our desks. I remember that vividly. That, and it was playing on my dad's boats. There was a moment in time, and this was during that, that Peter Ware was seemingly destined to be the greatest director of all time. Yeah. During that time, when you do Dead Poets, Peter Ware, of you, said, Josh was the one to beat in auditions. Were you 17 years old? I think so, yeah. Josh was the one to beat in auditions. No one came close to him in terms of charm and acting ability. Um, in terms of a moment in time, mm -hmm. all right, 17, are you aware? Because I imagine the playful nature of other guys your age on the set and fucking off and then having, of course, the great Robin Williams as everyone's my captain. Are you aware that Peter Ware at the time is potentially destined to be the greatest director of all? Or is he just the director and he was going to be? No, we, I mean, I knew of his films and I had seen a lot of his films and, and right. loved them. I had seen Witness and Gallipoli and The Year of Living Dangerously. Okay. And, and, um, you know, The Last Wave, and you know, once I knew he was directing film, I, that's when I watched that, or yeah. Picnic at Hanging Rock, and you know, you had to, it wasn't like Netflixy those days, obviously, so you had to like track down and find where to, where to get the yeah, VHS for that, or order yeah. it, yeah, but it, but I, but yeah, I, I, I was an, an enormous fan of, of his, of his work, and, um, and he was, I mean, it was, look, the, the, the truth told is that that movie was supposed to be made the year before with a different director. And um, and I, as the story goes, I mean, I'm, I'll leave the director's name out of it, just out of respect for him. But it was supposed to be this director, and I think that um, I think the studio wanted a big star, and the director wanted some people at the time who maybe 
Liam Neeson, Alec Baldwin, who weren't necessarily the big stars that they are today. And they couldn't get a big star to do it with this director, I think, is what happened. And the movie fell apart. And I know I was cast in it, Ethan was cast in it, and I, we were set to leave. It was going to film in Georgia. I was set to leave like the next week to go down to Georgia. I had a contract signed. I was booked. I was on that movie. And I at had, 16, thing fell apart. And the whole thing fell apart. And, and what are you thinking? I Dad, was, what does this mean? I mean, that's fucked well, up. Well, I, I went from thinking I got like my break to suddenly it's over, and you know, I was devastated. And then the movie picked back up a year later, and what's interesting about that quote from Peter, because I, I do remember sort of reading that somewhere, but, but... You didn't audition for him. You auditioned for the previous director. No, I, I just had the previous director. Back. But Peter, you know, had watched... We had screen tested that first time, and he had cer picked certain people I, 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 you know, I, I don't, he didn't cast anybody else. I think he, he liked Ethan for his role. And I don't think he was sure about me for my role. And I had to go and re-audition for the movie. Uh, yeah, yeah. So to read that, it, like, it feels extra special because I, that hurt me. I remember hearing like, okay, what's happening again? But now there's a new director and I've got to go and prove myself to this guy again. And I remember going in to audition for it. It was Howard Fuhrer, God rest his soul. Oh, the great away, Howard Fuhrer, great casting director. Who was wonderful, but Howard, you know, he wasn't the casting director at the time before, and I think he remembered I was cast, but he didn't know. So I went in to audition for the movie. Imagine this, and you're sitting around with all your friends, people that you knew in the New York theater community, these kids that were all, and a lot of them knew that I had been cast in the film already. And they go, and they're having everybody read for, you read for this, you read for that. And Howard's like, Josh, you read for this role. And I was like, and it wasn't the role that I, it wasn't Knox, the role that I had, I got. So I like, was really, I said, well, this is going horribly wrong. I'm, this is, I'll never get this movie again now. And I, I went over to Howard quietly and I said, hey, do you mind if I read for this role? Because this is the role that I had gotten. He's that, like, that oh, you booked. right, 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 sure, no problem. And so I went in and I read. And then, um, and then I got a call that Peter wanted to meet me. And I went in and read for him. And, uh, and, then, I, and then I found out I got the role. Uh, but it, so I think, I don't remember what it was. I think he even told me what it was that he wasn't sure about in the first thing. And I don't, I don't know. I, never, I don't think I ever saw that screen test. So I, don't, right. I don't really remember. But... It was a it was a long road to get that movie, so um, yeah. And how enamored are you guys when Robin Williams at that point shows up? Uh, I assume it just must have been crazy. It was crazy. I mean, I you know it, people ask me a lot of stuff about it when he died, and it was really sad. You know, uh, I I think at the time. He was the first bona fide movie star I had ever sort of encountered and worked with. And yet he also was this really sensitive and, and very much aware of how he wanted to use that on the movie. And let me be more clear. I, he, he wanted to just be a part of the team. You know, he knew he was the star, but he knew the movie and the core of the film was this, this, these kids, you know. And so he, he really wanted to sort of not not be a star in regards to the movie and just be one of the actors and, and worked hard to sort of to downplay his celebrity in that regard and some of that's also I'm sure Peter and in, in the working environment but I, I remember that vividly that he was and I used to tell jokes to him I mean I uh, we would do prior for him and he loved it and he'd laugh and um, but it's kind of genius if you think about it in terms of the design of the relationship to the students within the story to that professor that he'd be bigger than life in real life, it, it, it's true. It was a great, it was a genius stroke of casting. Yeah, and you know, and also one of those great moments which we've seen, you know, we saw a lot later in Robin's career, dramatic, and where just how gifted of an actor he was, and certainly in Goodwill Hunting and yeah. in many others. Um, that in Garp, I mean, he's just you know, the, the the guy was a was an incredible actor, and yeah. this was an, another opportunity to to show that. Um, it, he was. I mean, one moment, one memory really sticks out about it. I have to say this because I didn't was was I I knew that that he had sort of battled with addiction, and I was a big Crosby, Stills, Nash, still am Crosby, Stills, Nash young fan, and um, I, I think American Dream had just come out the Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young record, and there was a I'm not going to remember the name of the song, but a beautiful song by David Crosby that was about his his, his addiction. battling addiction. And, and Robin, I was listening to my Walkman, and I remember Robin asked me like what I was listening to, and I said, I'm listening to this, and I, I knew, I, I think you guys are friends, right? You know, and 
He said, do you mind if I listen? And I said, no. And he just, you know, he put it on. And I, I never forget, like, just this, this emotion that came over him. Understand him. But he was really moved by the song and hearing about his, his friends sing the song. That was, a, that was a memory, like, I never really shared with many people until the Kevin Pollack chat show mm -hmm. um, and the 19 people watching live. No, but but that was a moment where I just it touched on his sensitivity. Yeah. You know, his um, he was incredibly kind to all of us. I felt and really cool. And and I, I it's not like I kept in great touch with him. I think the last time I saw him was about a, maybe a year or so before he died. I ran into him at a opening of a play in New York, and he sat. We sat right next to each other and chatted for a bit, and it was great. Yeah. You know, well, he was he, in terms of staying in touch. I, I, he was a mentor of mine very early on in my stand-up career. Mm -hmm. and, and it was one of those things where even from the beginning he had this giant sort of ranch, I think either 600 or 6,000 acres uh, up in Northern California. And as things were exploding in LA, he was on that, okay. in that space eventually with his kids. And, and that part of his isolation seemed like it was okay that you didn't keep in touch. You know, because it was by design, and, and that was what, where, where he found solace, and hmm. so that's cool, and that's great. Um, I'm just going to continue to put off the good wife to, no, tor to ask whatever you want to what, torture. What, ask me. Any, I mean, what well, do you I, talk but about I've got those? my own personal interests, okay. and they. For, I'm not. I, I mean, I'm. I just. I'm happy to talk. I mean, if I can answer Josh's question, I mean, I don't. It's sort of a. Silly well, I think question. he was giving you shit. You know, I know. yeah. I want I want your uh, experience with the uh, Black Irish himself, Gabriel Byrne. Uh, treatments, in treatment, in treatment. Loved it. I mean, I loved working with Gabriel. It was great. Um, my favorite Gabriel line about <laughs> that show was, uh, you know, because he had to be there the whole time, and then each patient, you know, we get to come in and shoot our show in two days, and then we'd f I'd fly back to New York, and he's still there listening, and he'd say like, I fucking <laughs> like I feel like I'm. Oh, I'm flying coach to to Australia when <laughs> you fuckers keep coming in for one little leg and sit in first class and then you get to take off again and, you know, and jump out at Hawaii and I'm still chugging along on that 23 hour flight. But he, he, he was great to work with. Um, I loved, I love Gabriel. He's such an artist and such a, you know, was really I'm proud of the work we did on that. I it was a big kind of moment in time, quite frankly. I felt for both of you as friends to you both, the, the meaningfulness of the work that was being done on that show. It kind of resonated. I, I don't know where it sits in the pantheon of, yeah. of uh, ebbs, ebbs and flows and success. Yeah, I'm very career, proud of the work I, on I, that. I felt like it was impactful for both of you. Oh, that's that's good nice to hear. Yeah, I I I, I was. Um, People were talking about it a lot. It was good. I mean, well, you know, it's a real actor's piece. The, right. those, the, the way that show is set up. I mean, it really is like doing a play. I mean, we were, we were just talking about it the other day because one of the ads on Masters of Sex worked on it, and he was saying, you know, we would shoot twelve pages in the morning, twelve pages in the afternoon. Jesus. You do. I mean, I think we'd. Yeah, that would be the two. Is that about right? I, th I guess that's right. That's a half hour. So I mean, you would do. You know this side, you know, and then you do this. I mean, it was kind of crazy that that you, you there were certain times where the camera would just be rolling for nine, ten minutes straight, and they'd shoot a lot of times a little bit of longer lenses, just a little bit back, so you didn't quite feel like it was right. You know, you you doing a little you could play. really forget about it, and you just don't ever have that opportunity. Uh, you know, you don't have that often. It was great. I when I was I was making this film in France a couple years ago, and uh, who did I run into? But uh, Gabriel was there making a. He was making a French film as well. We were both making French films, staying at the same hotel. Wow. And got to reconnect with him. Um, and yeah, he came, you know, he, he came to see me in a play once too. And like, he doesn't, he didn't do the backstage thing, but he left me a little, you know, text afterwards, which is cool. He's, I just, you know, I really respect him. And, and I think he's a real artist. And uh, Oh boy, is it? Well, Jamie really, and I went and saw really an O'Neill play on Broadway. And he was Touch so... Touch the Poet. Yeah. I believe no, it was the, yeah. And backstage he was... Fucking hilarious. He's funny. Oh my god. You kid. Doesn't hurt to look at. And then I'm just there's throw that. that out there. And then there's that. <laughs> I have referenced him of all the ginormous, sexy movie stars I've hung with for two minutes. I have never seen, forgive the verbiage, 
a vagina magnet like Gabriel Byrne. <laughs> Ever. Ever. Not Bruce Willis, not Tom Cruise, not any of them. Yeah. Not Denzel Washington, any of them. There was a story that Madonna drove around at the height of her career in a limousine looking for Gabriel Byrne in Manhattan for an entire evening, just going from one place to another. There was, he was out there somewhere. It was like, a, a, like an interview or something in Vanity Fair or some fucking thing. It's like voguing, but Gabrieling. Hey, sweet kid. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Speaking of Vanity Fair, I had this thing force you to answer Vanity Fair. You gave this interview. This is another journalist who I, I just love how they're incapable of getting it right or I just conducting. It's, I think if it's Vanity Fair, I think I know who that is. She's nice, actually. I like her. She was talking about. Um, trying to give advice to younger actors, and you were yeah, saying... Yeah. this is Joanna Robinson. And you were saying, yeah. it's not something... I'm, what I was getting from it, yeah. paraphrasing, it's not something I'm comfortable doing. Yeah. I don't think I'm someone who should be giving anyone advice. And then she just stayed on you, and then got some pretty... Some advice. Um, I don't know. I would put it off on somebody else. <laughs> but if I had one piece of advice for somebody, I would say that it's a brutal business. Have a life outside of the business. Don't be defined solely by what you do. Be defined by your actions and what you do as a human being. Read, learn, travel. Don't stop pursuing other things that interest you because the business is brutal. It's up, it's down. People want to tell you, you can do this, you can't do that. There's highs and lows. It's very easy to be swayed by that. You can see how the industry can really chew people up, especially people who are young. Mm -hmm. I didn't always do that. I started young, but looking at it now, I have a great life, a beautiful wife, we're starting a family. And that's really good, and that's a good feeling to have. That makes me feel more secure in the way I pro approach my career now. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, you know, there's a lot of advice to give, but the have a life outside of this nonsense, it's kind of great, man. Is it? Yeah. I don't know. I, I think... Because all, all the advice usually focuses on what pitfalls to avoid. Sure. And then a lot of times if, if actors do ask me, I'll say, you know, look, train is important. And like certainly like take lessons and learn about acting and care about give acting. Give a shit. Give a shit, you know. Okay, you ready to give your life to it. You ready to give your life to it. And like, you know, really, really, you know, care enough to, 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 to do the work and, 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 and study and have some technique. And, and I think in the world we live in now where everybody's sort of, you know, used to be like you kind of earned your stripes a little bit and you build your way up and now it's like so so many people just get thrown out there. I just want to be famous yeah and some are incredibly talented you know and, and sometimes you get to see that and other times you don't because they just flame out because you just it's just the business wants to chew people up and spit them out but I think what I was getting at was like I think around that also soon I was reading a lot of books about the older directors and the the guys like in, you know, Who the Devil Made It, you know, Bogdanovich's book of interviews of all those great old-time directors, that so many of them had lives, you know, they were sort of the new frontier and sort of breaking into this business as it was, as it was being invented. Right. And they didn't go to film school. Not that there's anything wrong with people who go to film school, but I mean, they're, they brought with them all their life experience. And I think that's all I was trying to say was like, don't forget that. And I'm always trying to tell that to young actors when they do ask me and I do feel comfortable enough to say to them it's just you know study other stuff you know what I mean that that's you, you're gonna bring all of that with you to acting I mean learn learn the technique study acting of course but have some life experience behind you really kind of try to have a life outside of the business right I'm I'm saying that uh, uh, because I'm trying to do it as well myself right. I don't always succeed it's not as if I've got it all figured out but I know that th that's important to me because that's the one thing the business can't take from you you know and that's important, you know, yeah. that you have that separated because it's, you know, as an actor too. I mean, it's like, I'm not selling this mug or I'm not selling, you know, it's like we're selling ourselves. So the, th the thing that I find so hard about it is, and why I kept saying, hearing it read back how brutal it is, is I think the brutality is one in which in order for us to be good at what we do, we have to be sensitive. That's my feeling as an actor. There has to be, you have to have a sensitivity, you know, to be able to wear other people's shoes, to, to live, live through other characters and put your own sort of humanity into that. In order to do that, you, you can't just turn that off, you know, like a faucet, you know. You're sensitive and you're open, and with that comes great stuff that you learn from the work you do and also a lot of negativity and criticism and, 
people shitting on you. And, and y y you have to stay open to that so that stuff comes in and it's really hard. And I think what's helped me is just realizing like, you know, I, I, I care about other stuff outside of what I do as well. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and <laughs> I don't know. When it all does decide to shit on you at any given moment, it's wildly important to have an actual life to feel great about, to balance the, yeah. that brutality. I think so. I mean, look, I mean, for the most part, business has been very kind to both of us, but it's still brutal. I mean, you know, oh, it's, yeah. it's tough, you know, and the you, ebb and flow is you, you question a lot, like, motherfucker. why am I doing this? Yeah. And, you know, did it choose me or did I choose it? And so, Part of that is me starting so young, knowing what I wanted to do. That I always want people to like question that. It's like if you know what you want to do, do it. But at the same time, when I see kids that are really going to school and doing things I didn't do, and go to college and getting this great education, there's things that I wish that I had done. You know, because the business will always be there for you. You know, you can do both. Right. So um, we have a thing on the show where we ask people to write in from the viewers that are watching right now. Okay. And then Jamie forwards the questions over to this computer wow, this from her computer. Wow, tech. Yeah. She doesn't so have to shout them at me. How does that happen? Is there like a wire you connecting know what? these two you computers? You don't need to know. You ask Chris McQuarrie if you want to know. <laughs> shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> just shut, Josh, shut your fucking mouth right now. <laughs> and just do as I fucking say. What a great fucking memory. asshole. What oh my God. I was like, why are we not making a, like a video of this? Like, just him on my screen going, yeah, because he's like, you know, where he was living in Seattle at the time. Yeah, that's great. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but I did all this, and I got like, I think he'd be really excited, and I got this to work. Yeah, that's great. Now shut up and back away from the computer. <laughs> this is from Chris Hill. These are uh, rapid-fire questions, five of them. Okay. This or that. This is the T5 This is the T5. I saw you tweeting about. Uh-huh. This is uh, from at TMF Chris Hill. That's his Twitter handle. Ready? Yeah. Comedy or drama? Right now, comedy. Orioles or Ravens? Sophie's choice. I, that, that's a both. Playing a sportscaster or a football coach? A <laughs> football coach. The Bachelorette or The Apprentice? Bachelorette. Stephen Baldwin and Threesome or Stephen Baldwin and The Usual Suspects? <laughs> um, Baldwin and Biodome. Yeah. <laughs> you got five out of five. Wow. Wow, you pulled out the last one. You got to go off, off the reservation sometimes. Biodome. Yeah. Absolutely. Come on. Why not? Yeah. Uh, when I first met Stephen Baldwin, he was wearing leather pants. I should point out he had not arrived on a motorcycle or a horse. <laughs> <laughs> he was just wearing leather pants. That's a great line, right? by the way. That's a great line. Um, were you lip syncing Pryor's album, by the way? Or were you doing an impersonation because you were obsessed by it? I, I, both. Yeah. I would play, play the records and the tapes over and over, and I would just go around doing it all the time. Yeah. yeah. Another thing about Alan Arkin, him and his uh, youngest son, Tony Arkin. Tony, I know. Created Tony. a game called One Word Impressions, where you can only use one word to get the entire impression across. And it cannot be a word the person's famous wow, for that's using. That's tough. Okay, I'm gonna do one for you first, and then you're gonna give no, me prior. No, no, I'm not doing one impressions word. with you. One word impri impression of, from prior. I'm not. I'm prior. not playing any impression game with you. <laughs> but, but but it's prior. No, that's not fair. It's your that's wheelhouse. Fair. All right, all right. We don't have to. Um, I'd like to hear yours. I'm sure, it's gonna be Walken or Falk. Nope. Nope. I'll do the word. You tell me who it okay. is. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Maybe I should have you close your eyes. Okay. Here we go. Bananas. Say it again. Bananas. Gabriel Byrne. Very close. <laughs> Liam Neeson. Liam Neeson. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Very fucking close. Uh, Bananas? Yeah, bananas. <laughs> amazing. That's amazing. It's ridiculous is what it is. Um, I've been working on, uh, on doing an impression of John Depp. You know this actor John Depp? Is that like Johnny Depp? <laughs> Same guy. Yeah. Yeah. Can I hear it? Nope. Still working on it. <laughs> just, just awful. Just horrendous. Um, I, uh, did this one just pop up? Another tweet five from Scott Ash. At Scott66Ash. 70s Orioles 
or 2015 Orioles. In your face. Um, I, yeah, so I don't know. You I, love them all. Yeah. I, uh, 2015 Orioles, because we're in the, we're now. Come on, motherfucker. Let's go. Maybe Sorkin or the field? I don't know what the fuck that means. The field. <laughs> <laughs> Regular or guest star? What? What? Um, oh, this next one's good. Boog's barbecue or crab cake? Ah, oh, come on. Uh, well, I, God, that's impossible. <laughs> Boog's just because I love Boog so much. Yeah. And the last one, Dead's Poet or, or Sports Night. Um, two two uh, watershed moments. Yeah. I mean, honestly. That's fun. Ridiculous. Um, so you're at home. The agent calls. I've got this script. It's a pilot. It's called The Good Wife. Will you just fucking read it? And you say... Yeah, no. It actually was... It was Juliana called and said, Hey, making this pilot, because she was a friend for many years, and she said, uh, It shoots in New York. I think this is a great role for you in it. You know, would you look at it? Now, I don't know if I was there, you know, first guy, second guy, third guy. I have no idea where I was in the line. But I wasn't really looking to do a TV show at the time. Um, just, I don't know what I was focused on, but I said I would look at it. And I read it, and I thought the writing was really good. I didn't have a ton to do in the pilot, but I was told that the role was going to be pretty pivotal, pivotal in the show. And, and I thought the writing was really strong, and I loved Juliana, and I loved Christine Baranski, and it's shot in New York. And I just... Uh, you got just, the Chris Noth. I just, yeah, and I knew Chris a little bit. I mean, I just bought a place in New York. First time I'd ever owned anything in my life. So I thought, yeah, let's give it a go. So the timing worked out. Yeah, and I was really happy I did. Yeah, no kidding. Um, it's a great experience. Th when the show is, it seemed like it was an instant hit. Is that a incorrect me memory? I, you know, I, I don't know. I think it, I think I feel like right critically, out of the I think critically it was, it was and an she was winning hit. awards immediately. Yeah, I think, I think the show, I mean, I, I think, I don't know about the ratings. I think the ratings did really well in the beginning. I think the ratings for the show were always like good. Yeah. I don't think they were like, I think maybe really good in the beginning and now, you know, good. But I think the show brings that network other things than just ratings. Yeah. And I think they saw the quality in it immediately and saw that. And so, Maybe it was because we were shooting it in New York and just felt more insulated from that, and because we had that sort of critical response to it early on. Um, it really felt like you know we got to kind of do what we wanted to do, which was nice on a network schedule. You know. Yeah, and the there's something about having a regular job that at times can feel strange as an actor. Mm -hmm. Even if the, the run of a movie production is three or four months and it feels like a regular job or you get something that shoots on a lot, yeah. and you're driving on the Paramount lot to go to work every day, and you feel, oh, this is what it must have been like in the 40s. Yeah. And what about, like you said, new house, new home, in New York, yeah. first time, on a series. It's doing certainly well enough in the first season that there's a future to it. Yeah. And it actually feels like a, the worst, oh, not worst, but the most bizarre word in show business, security. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, I, but I had experienced that, I mean, for only two years with Sports Night, and that was right. the first time I had sort of done, and that's, you know, so I had, growing up, since I'm acting, since I'm 15, never having that sense of security or the structure that television gives you, I responded well to that. It worked, I liked knowing that I had a job, and I liked knowing, you know, even though within the structure, you don't know when you're working next week, but you know you're working. And that part was tricky, you know, because you never really quite had, you know, you never knew when your days off were going to be. So you're kind of locked in for a good nine plus months. But yeah, knowing that you're working with the same people. I mean, Julianne and I talk about this all the time because she's had two epic long runs on shows. That, you know, the bonds that you create on a television show that goes on for a long period of time, even Sports Night was only two years, you know, but still, the amount of hours you work on a television show, just in the length of time, the whole season of television, particularly network television. Yeah. Uh, bonds get created that are really, really deep, and and there, are, you know, there are people on that show that I'll stay close with my whole life. You know, um, Juliana is the only one I knew going in, and obviously we're still friends. But Christine Baranski is one of my favorite people I've ever worked with, ever gotten to know. Um, I absolutely love her with all my heart. I loved working with her. I love her as a person. She actually just emailed me the other day, and I hadn't heard from her in a while. And she's just a really special human being. We bonded so closely. 
some of that crew is just amazing. Um, and I, I miss I miss a lot of them. It's great, you know. They're I great remember people. Alan Cummings also was at the wedding uh, yeah. party. Uh, yeah, it just seemed like a real tight knit family. It is. It's good. It's a good group. And then getting to direct a couple episodes, right? Done three. Three. Mm -hmm. Loved it. Yeah, I did. I, lo I love directing. I, I really do want to. I want to make a movie. I want to do what you're doing. It sounds fun. It's not. It's not fun at all. <laughs> it will be. It will be when it's done. The. Um, the daily uncertainty has been fantastic. Yeah? Yeah. Good. No. No. Get out. Run. Brace. Um, um, yes. What have you got? I just think the chat room is going to be a little upset if we don't talk about the great 80s classic, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. Yay. I love it. What about it? What's the question? Corey, you, 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 I don't, they, just, they just keep mentioning it, and, they, and everybody keeps throwing up quotes from it. If you're of my age, born in 82, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a classic. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, look, that was like, that was a blast to do. Christina, um, um, what did I say? You said it was a blast to do Christina. Yeah. <laughs> well, <what's> the... <laughs> Go on. <laughs> it's been a long time. My <laughs> coffee ran out. No, I, I had, I mean, it was like my first time in LA shooting that movie. Really? I, mean, I had spent like a lot of time in LA. I remember staying at a hotel in Sunset. We were shooting out in like Santa Clarita, um, Duchovny. Um, I had, I mean, she was so coming off, you know, just married with children. It was so, so, so much fun. She was so nice to me. And like I had a great time working with her. Steve, uh, Stephen Herrick, who directed it, was a great guy. Um, Steve, Steve Herrick? Herrick, Stephen Herrick. I worked with him. What yeah. year was it? Late eight, it's gotta be eighty nine. Like I think, yeah. Yeah, it was a blast. I mean, I had a lot of fun with that movie. I, it was called the Real World when we made it. It wasn't called Don't Tell One of the Babies Is Dead. Mm -hmm. I think they changed that. It's fun, you know. Oh, um, I they, take that back. I was way off. Ninety one. Ninety one. Yeah. I, guess I thought we, it was eighty nine. We made it in sure. like eighty nine or ninety, but maybe it came out in ninety one. I have fond memories from it. I mean, I, it was fun, and it's definitely like one of those things with cable and video and DVDs. It's definitely endured and. There's a certain type of age. You oh, know, there's a cult that are, following. That's yeah. what that's what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah, totally. It was just kind of a trip. When a movie has its run, has its course. Yeah. You put it in the into the order, pecking order of, of looking back on things you did, and then people will come up to you and say, No, no. That was a big part of my fucking life. Yeah. It, it needs to be special to you. Yeah. Yeah. I worked on okay. on something the other other night. Zoe Bell, the great stunt woman actress and the director said would you mind recording something for my brother and then Zoe said my boyfriend right uh, any line from Willow will will literally make his year and uh, you know at first you're, you you think they're teasing you and then they get more genuine, more serious. And then he starts telling stories of where they were in their lives when they started quoting Willow to each other on a regular basis and moments in their lives when they would call up to cheer the other one up when something had happened by a quote from this movie. Mm -hmm. It's those kind of things that we don't, I don't know that we're in touch with. Yeah, I don't, I don't, have, a, I don't have a big problem with it. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I certainly... Uh I can tell what it means to people. So. Yeah. In fact, there was an interview that everybody did recently on BuzzFeed, and I got kind of pissed off because it said I declined to be interviewed for it, and I was really mad. And I, I read it, and I was like, I didn't decline. I never got asked to be interviewed for it. But then somehow it got in the chain of my people. Somehow I didn't get to it. So when I contacted them, they were like, oh, we reached out. I was like, oh, sorry. It was a mess up. Because I would have I would have gladly lent, lent, lent some quotes to it like everybody did, because I had fun on that movie. It was a good time. I mean. I mean, artistically, I mean, is it a movie that I think, yeah, no, but it means something to whatever it means to well, people. Well, the reason I went into detail was, I'm curious what movie was like that for you, where you and your friends, because I remember my, being 107, my guys and I, we would quote Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles was one we had on like VHS early on, and I would watch it every day after school <laughs> with my friends. We'd come home from school, watch it every day. Star Wars. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but these are classic. classics. I'm talking like he and I quote like beaten. 1987's Dragnet constantly, which is probably not a great movie. Were there movie. esoteric smaller but films? 
Because the in-laws, by the way, was not a huge hit. The in-laws. I can quote every line. I mean, I used to, I used to, yeah, I used to, I don't remember quoting every line, but I definitely was into those, I was into the in-laws, I loved it. Yeah. My friend uh, Craig Singer and I would, would uh, leave messages for each other saying, uh, page 28. And that was page 28 from the movie, of the book, Mario Puzo wrote The Godfather. And page 28 is when Sonny is banging the girl up against the doorway when his crew is waiting down the hallway. The security guys are waiting for him to, for Sonny to, and as 12 year olds, yeah. that's all that mattered. <laughs> Sonny was banging this woman <laughs> against the wall and it's on page 28. You know it's Amazing. on page 28, right? Amazing. Uh, uh, Amazing. <laughs> just, you know those weird memories. Of, yeah, of and, course. And, and a- attaching meaning to them beyond the thing. Um, you're uh, you're chilling on the west side. Is that a first for you with the family? Yeah. That I'm going to let you get back to. I, yeah. I, I can't thank you enough for uh, spending your Sunday with us. Uh, uh, a, a little bit of it anyways. Um, what's that? What are we, what are She's you? quoting Dragnet. Oh, okay, yeah. Do we, do, we, do we answer everything enough to everybody that might be listening? That, that anything that we're missing out on? Well, I don't... I, I, she gets a shit ton and then forward a couple because, as I'll explain away from the camera, they're not all amazing? Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Um, <laughs> That's the, just me or you mean general? Oh, general every way? week. Yeah. She I was did. just in the chat room. She was just typing, just listen to me. Just shut the fuck up and write a question. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Exactly. This one, She's learning. This was a good a, one, the Chris McCory school. I want to give some shout out to J Mac who does the research on the show. This was something that I wouldn't have asked, and as long as I've known you, haven't bothered to ask. But you grew up in Baltimore when Oprah was a local newscaster on Channel 13. Yes, she was my local newscaster growing so up. So, what is that local? Ex- that's a Baltimore experience. The explosion she, and, and she world st- domination. She started as a local newscaster, and then she had a show with Richard Scher who's a family friend, and they had a show called, I believe those people are talking, that they did together. And that was like a morning talk show. And, um, and then she went on to Chicago to do a similar show, and the rest is history. Yeah, I would take a lot of pride in that. She was, she was in Baltimore and grew up watching Oprah. And so your local- I was in Oprah before anybody else in Oprah. The I think is that, what you're America. saying. You have a formal newscaster who accomplished something the, the, the uh, mafia never could which is to elect a president. You're a former newscaster, local newscaster. That's right. That's got to be a sense of Baltimore pride right there. <laughs> That's fantastic. No? <laughs> That's great. I mean, look. I'm a <laughs> if you ask, Page 28? If you ask John F. Kennedy's father, did he use the mob, did he use Sinatra and the mob in Chicago yeah. to help JFK get elected? In the same way that Bush Sr. pulled some shit in Florida, there's no, there's not too great a dissimilarity there. I'm five seconds away from pissing in my pants. Okay, I have good. to go to the bathroom so bad. Uh, sit there and comfortably. We've got just one last piece of business for you. You saw the Larry King game. Every show has ended with the guest doing a Larry King game. And again, I want a bad Larry King impression. So there's no pressure to do anything okay. good. And then Larry shares something about himself. It's not you. You're, you're Larry now. Yeah. And he's 114. And then you go to the phones, and it's, the city is funny sounding. It's helpful. There's your camera. When you're ready, your Larry King game is what stands between you and ending this show. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Already classic. Yeah. Already classic. Um, you know the funny thing when you shit your pants on the air? I, I want to say, I've always thought, by the way, Larry King would just start off like, and I love Larry King, but I always felt like, Somebody should do like, you know, like um, Smigel or something, like a thing like where it's just, he's just suspenders right. and a stump. <laughs> so that when he leaves the thing, that's all he is. I love Larry King though. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> Sweet back to shitting my pants. Um, so we're here talking to Sting. <laughs> and I, I don't know where I'm going with shitting my pants, but I wanted to say Bellevue. Nice. Hey. <laughs> Uh, That's horrible. That's the worst <laughs> thing I've ever been asked to do, and I sucked at it. You Sorry. Hit, you hit, you hit Sorry. seven dingers with on your journey, my friend. Sorry. I'm buddy. here with Sting, and also just starting with hi. 
Hi. Yeah. Uh, These are no, words. but you know, you know those moments where Larry King when he'd be like, "Hello." Yeah. Are you there? Yeah. Like his patience, you could so tell. So perturbed. As nice, he's got a temper. Oh yeah. And you know he would snap yeah. on somebody. What's your question? <laughs> that was another one of his. What's your question? Do you have a question for the guest? All right, Larry, we'll get there. All right, sit down comfortably for four more seconds while I wrap things up. Next week, Sam Levine will be hosting the show in my absence. Uh, and then we're coming right back, I believe, with Zoe Bell, who we spoke of earlier. I want to thank uh, Jason McIntyre, Mike Doom, and Corey Levin sitting in for Sam Levine, Jamie Foxx, Samantha Ward, Natalie Rosen, the new executive assistant, and of course, evil Dr. Chen, who made it into the show as well. Casey, uh, Sean Casey, and everyone here at uh, Westside Comedy Theater for looking after us. Until next time, and as always, get out of my face.